Check one, two. Go! Go! Curious about real estate? Yes! Then you've come to the right place. Get the knowledge you need. Get over the fear and get started. This is the Michael Quarles Real Estate Show with your host, Michael Quarles. Hello, everybody. Michael Quarles with podcast number 95. We're five away from 100. That's going to be a great day. Today we have the five questions sent in by real estate investors like yourself who had a question and needed it answered. We're going to try really hard today to do that. And remember, if you have a question, send it to support at bsffacademy.com. One more time, support at bsffacademy.com. Here we go. Question number one. Is it necessary on all deals to have an appraisal and a BPO done? Why or why not? Here's my rule of thumb. BPO, always. We're want, absolutely wanting a, a second opinion, always. Whether they charge you for that BPO or not is a different story, and it's not just a CMA. I want interior and exterior pictures. I wanna, I wanna know how that property compares to other properties in the marketplace. So it's not just a CMA. Here's my rule of thumb on appraisals. If I have less than $7,500 at risk, I am not going to worry about an appraisal. So if I've done a 100% seller carry back, not going to worry about it as long as my BPO substantiates my seven data sets. But if I have more than that into it, yeah, it just seems reasonable to, to make sure it's a check and balance system. If I'm going to put private money on the property, so I'm, I'm, I have a private lender who is going to loan on it, I'm absolutely in all cases going to have an appraisal done. I just, I just think that's the respectful way of dealing with private money. So great question. Question number two, do you have a home inspection on every house you purchase through your system? Why or why not? I don't do home inspections. Um, just haven't felt, felt the need to do that. When we have the BPO done, the BPO agent's gonna come back with those items that they believe um, are at risk. Keep in mind, uh, they're disclosing those to us. And the um, the appraiser is going to do the same thing. So yeah, I'm not, gonna, I'm, I'm not going to spend the money on the home inspection. But great question. Question number three, when marketing to multifamily residences or apartments in inclusive of duplexes, triplexes, and quads, or are apartments considered five or more? Yeah, apartments for me would be considered five or more because it's, it's, it's a more of a commercial loan, not just the uh, uh, regular residential loan. And, and I'm not looking for those, by the way. Some people do, but I'm not. So in some marketplaces, I am uh, using the, the duplexes, triplexes, and quads, uh, along with single family residences, but I'm never, for my personal marketing, never going after apartments. And um, again, it's because I wanna, I wanna deal with the mom and pop mentality and not corporate America. Um, and if I wanted to do apartments, it would be a completely different marketing campaign. So uh, we're not doing it in all areas, but some areas we do. And there's reasons we pick the areas that we, we do that with. You, when you're gonna look at an area, you can see that there's a large majority of um, rental property in the market. And if there are, then you've got a market to it, just like you would if there were a lot of condos in a marketplace, um, things like that, then you'd wanna market to condos. So if the condos made up 34%, 35% of, of um, the housing, then you'd, you'd, be, you'd be silly not to, to market to it. Question number four, I understand how and why to use a standard formula of 70% ARV minus repairs my whole, minus my wholesale profit. However, I have some buyers who seem less interested in getting a great deal 30% equity position on a property and more interested in just monthly cash flow. For properties that fit those sellers' guidelines, I assume I can work with less motivated sellers, maybe use 85% ARV minus... And, Guys, I don't know anything about ARV and, and, and wholesaling. I, I mean, I do know something about it, but I just don't like preaching it. Um, I, here's, my, here's my formula. You know, I want to I get something at 60 cents on the dollar, 55 cents on the dollar, 65 cents on the dollar. Um, if I'm going to turn it into a rental, great. I've got some rentals now, yuck. Did I say it? I own rentals, yuck. But however, I'm not stupid. Well, some days I am, but not most days. And I know if I have a 24 month return on my investment, a complete return um, from the rental income after I pay my taxes and my insurance and uh, my maintenance and um, vacancy factor. But if I have a 24 month recapture of my funds, why in the heck 
would I flip that thing? I want to turn it into a rental and, and go forward with that. Um, but I absolutely don't like um, buying rentals where they're over leveraged. Now, there's a lot of people that preach over leverage, you know, over leverage, over leverage, over leverage. I'm a firm believer. Let's, let's look at it from the dollars and cents. If, if we're buying at 60% off of a property, that leaves 40% profit, right? And we buy five of those. Okay, so let's assume we, we buy five. So we have um, five houses that we have 40% equity in. So we're gonna flip, so we've made 200%. Well, here comes another, here comes the sixth one. And let's assume for a second that the cost of the sixth one is 60%. So call it cost, cost to me um, a 40% discount. If I take and subtract my 60% from my 200% that I gained from flipping my five, then I still have, what, 140% left over to market and live and, and do all the good stuff that we have to do uh, while we're finding these six houses. So I'm a firm believer that every sixth house that you, you buy, if you want to pay cash for it and keep it as a rental, that's the way you do it. You don't buy leveraged property and keep them as a rental, although a lot of people do it that way. But here's the thing, folks. Man, if you're over leveraged, you're just over stressed. That's just another word for stressed. So I'm, I'm a firm believer that if, if it's paid for, and my rentals are paid for, um, that's, a, that's a better day. And they're paying me back. That's the key point, is they're paying me back. And, um, and they're going to go up in value, and that's going to be great. But that's how I look at it. So every sixth house, buy it. Pay for cash for it. Put it in your rental portfolio. Now, I know there's a lot of guys and gals and, and several of my coaching students who have mega rentals. Um, and some of them are leveraged and some of them are cashed. Um, I believe that everybody would believe and, and agree with me that a cash basis rental program um, or cash or 100% equity rental program is the best one to have. Um, but it's all choices. So um, pick your choice and, and run with it. Um, I think 85% ARV is a little bit too close. Question number five. It's a scenario question. Cool. An out-of-state um, owner contacts me regarding the letter I sent. They think the as-is value of the vacant house is $50,000 because the area was damaged and run down many years ago when the seller bought it. However, the as-is value is actually $100,000. Do you let them know the real value? Well, what? Uh, great question. I think we do. I, I think we, we kind of do that in conversation. And um, ultimately, we're going to buy it for whatever we want to buy it for. But I think that ultimately, I think we have to be honest. And they're going to find out if we don't, if we aren't honest. And, um, you know, in our, in our systems here, you know, we ask the seller, what do they think the house is worth? And they say, you know, 25000 whatever they say. If it comes back at $30,000, we're not going to really bring that up. But I think we, we need to bring it up if, if it comes back out at twice as much. Um, because we have a business model. Our business model says that we're going to buy them at $0.55, $0.60 cents on the dollar, $0.65 cents on the dollar. Um, of, of value, of as is value. That's our business model. Our business model isn't um, a business model based upon lying and, and deceit and, and uh, tantamount of theft kind of stuff where you know one thing's true and you're keeping that from the other person. And you got to ask yourself, if you were reversing the roles, should you know? Would you like to know? And if the answer is yes, then you fall forward and explain it. Now they may they may say thank you, but it's okay. I don't, you know, I I'm 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 fine with the fifty. And if they are, that's great. But but you know, stand up and and be prepared to because your business model says you're buying them at fifty, sixty cents, seventy cents on the dollar. Well, if it's really worth a hundred, and they thought it was worth fifty, that's just going to give them more money. But it's still going to fit your business model. Your business model is not changing, but your 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 ethics changes or will change if you don't do it that way. And do you, do you, I mean, we talk a lot about ethics in, in real estate because it's really important because we're sit with these, these situations and, or hit with these situations and, you know, fall forward. And there's nothing, guys and gals, there's nothing wrong with paying more for a house when you can justify it and it's in your business model. 
You know, there's some people that would, it's better for them to have the money than you. And again, we set the, these business models in place and these guidelines and systemizations in place so we can follow them. They're not there to, you know, to feel good when they fit. They're there to follow and, 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 and do right by them. And so do right by yourself and do right by people. Um, yeah, I would absolutely, I'd absolutely say something. Getting back to coaching, because i got to tell you guys one more time, it is going to absolutely end this month. Um, I have taken on enough students, and enough students will, uh, and I just have a few more holes that will fill up, I'm sure. But this month, at the, and, and uh, don't, what is this, June? Yeah, uh, by the end of the June, um, the one-on-one -on -one coaching program is going to come to a halt. Um, and it may reopen at some time in the future, probably will. Um, but I've got to make sure that I can honor and can meet the commitments that I have made to those folks that signed up. Um, so I just want you guys to know that if any of you are on the fence, I don't want you to get mad at me if you call up in you know July 1st and it's not available because it won't be. The other thing, um, we've, we're posting daily deals over on our Academy site, and that's um, bsffacademy.com, but you get there by signing up at buysellfixslip.com and just click on uh, daily deals and there's a little form that'll take you over there. Um, it's just a small fee to listen to those, but those things are just friggin' fr fantastic to listen to and um, understand that it's possible for you too, kind of stuff. And understand that what, you know, what a motivated seller sounds like and what, and how you convert one that's not necessarily um, displaying that they're motivated uh, and how you convert that into an opportunity as well. How to renegotiate, how to get cash terms, seller financing terms, cash terms, um, sub two terms, all those kinds of good things. So that's absolutely something that um, you should listen to. Any of you guys need the forms that I use? I have a form package over on the the Academy site. Um, I think it's 197 bucks for a bunch of forms, the contracts included in it, and all kinds of neat stuff. Get a hold of support at bsffacademy.com if you need any of that stuff. Until next time, thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to the Michael Quarles Real Estate Show. Get more info and stay in touch at michaelquarles.com.